What is going on YouTube and Spotify? This is the Just BSN Podcast and today episode 43. Um, not really a ton going on in the sports world right now. Obviously, we just had the All-Star game, so we will obviously recap that. And then we'll probably just BS a little bit more because that's what this show is about. That's the whole name of the game. That's what we do. We just BS around here. So, uh, yeah, Andrew, how are we feeling this week? You know, obviously, there's not a lot going on right now. So it's kind of everything's in limbo right now. Yeah, dude, I've been feeling good. But you know what? The sun is shining. It's been great weather. The, it's the a moods. beautiful, beautiful day, by, by, by the way. This yeah. is like this is one of the nicest like overall days I think we've had in a month. Like It's been Absolutely. brutally hot here, and it's like 75 and sunny all day today. It's been gorgeous. Yes. So, it's been fantastic. It's been a nice break from that. Um, <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and speaking of break, that's kind of what the guards have right now. Uh, obviously, uh, they play this weekend, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But... Uh, you know, we talked last week about, uh, you know, how a lot of Cleveland guys that end up going to an all-star game or even a pro or even a pro bowl game or, you know, do the home run derbies and all that. They never really do well. And Jose did pretty well in the home run derby. I, I know he didn't win it, but he, you know, he went, he at least got through the first, the first round. Um, and then some guards players really played well um, in the all-star game and, and they really helped them win that all-star game. Uh, you know, Quan obviously led off. I know he scored a run. Uh, I think he got a hit as well. Um, you know, Fry hits the go-ahead RBI hit late in the game. And then obviously our boy Class A, who is arguably right now the best closer in the game, closes it out for the American League once again for the second straight season. Uh, so guards players came out and they played well. And, uh, you know, especially guys that you didn't really expect. You always expect, you know, Ramirez to play well or even Naylor to do anything. And it was the other guys, Quan, it was Fry, it was Classe, that, that really made the big impact. So uh, what was your take overall just from uh, the week and, and just being able to, to see our our guys do well? Dude, it was great. Um, just have, Just even having the guys that went, were a, was a great group of guys and i think the guardians also had i think it was the second most or the most on the net al roster of the most players on the yeah. team from the i think it was orioles was the other one maybe i think the orioles was the other one um but yeah dude it, it's so fantastic especially shout out to da- guys like david fry who first all-star appearance and comes up with a very clutch hit late in the, later in the game to clutch it up for the AL All-Stars and give them the big W. And yep. I mean, it's just a great all-around performance from everyone. Like you said, Quan with a run, he also got walked. It wasn't a hit, he got walked. Okay. So, and I know everyone was pissed because I know when the lineups came out, everyone was so upset that it wasn't Judge first to bat because everyone's like, we want Judge versus Paul Skeens. And then I went on Twitter and said, uh, why Quan's a better hitter than Judge, and you're like, well, Judge is batting 303. He's got 35 home runs. He's got, you know, he's got this op like over a thousand OPS and stuff like that. I was like, okay, Quan also has close to a thousand OPS. He's batting 350, and yeah, he's played like 20 less games than Judge. But let's be real, his Quan's average would probably be a lot higher. OPS would probably be a lot higher. Like everything would just be higher. Like I was like, Quan is the true hitter on that roster. Yeah, on that AL roster, he was the true hitter. And yes, he got watched because again, he's patient at the plate, doesn't swing at dirt or anything. And he gave Paul Skeens a good run. Now, don't get me wrong, Skeens got got him, got him to fly out. But it's not like Judge did any better. Judge grounded out the third, and. Like it, it, everyone thought Judge was gonna be able to smack a home run, and of course, all these Yankees fans were so upset. Like, oh, Aaron Judge is t- ten times the player. I was like, I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. Quan is a better hitter, in my opinion. I think Quan is twice the hitter because my thing is too. Aaron Judge has already struck out a hundred and like sixteen times this season. Quan has struck out twenty five times. I was just this entire say that. season. Yeah, twenty five times, the most. In the season where Quan struck out was, I think his second season last yeah. year. Yeah, it was probably he, last year. 
and he struck out 70 times. In a whole season. In there's a whole over season. there's over a hundred, was it hundred and eighty two or hundred and sixty two games? There's hundred and sixty two games in the season. He's had almost I think it was close to like four hundred at bats, struck out seventy times. Yeah. Aaron this Judge season, is very known for striking well, out or hitting home runs. It's well, like he's the most like Jim Toto me, I think anybody I've yeah. ever seen. <laughs> well that's the thing. Like if you look at Judge's stats, it's fifty home runs and around 200 plus strikeouts yeah so he either hits a home run or he's striking the hell out yeah there's almost no in between he's either hitting home runs or he's striking out and for me and like the thing is too and i mentioned this as well kwan has more three hit games than zero hit games yeah kwan has more three hit games than games where he didn't get a single hit that's an insane stat yeah. Like you're telling me this guy went three for four, four for four, you know, and just had more of the three hit games than fucking zero hit games. That's that's an insane stat that no one else can accomplish besides probably Stephen Kwan and maybe Ichiro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean and, Kwan is like a, a he's a true leadoff hitter. Like he's yeah. exactly what you want as a leadoff hitter. You want your leadoff hitter to get on base and be smart and, and work pitches. And just be able to to create really long at bats and wear guy guys out for for your cleanup guys for for, yeah. for your three four slots. That's what the whole like the three four spot is where Judge should be because he's power. That's yeah. where you want like that's where you always put your power or you always put guys that can at least drive in ribbies. And that's why you're always seeing Ramirez well, and Naylor and at ours. You know, well, like, the that's thing, that's how it goes. Well, the thing is, they were afraid because obviously in the All Star game, pitchers usually only go one inning, and right. they were afraid that. So this judge was batting. Yeah, I think he was batting. Was actually, I think he was batting fifth actually, because I think Juan Soto was before him at four. Yeah, and they were afraid of Skeens getting like maybe like a yeah. one two three inning and then not facing Judge and everyone's gonna be pissed about it. And it's like, dude, who cares? Yeah, who cares? Honestly, I'm kind of glad Judge wasted his opportunity because it was just wasted anyways. Yeah. So you bring up all this hype and Judge didn't do jack. He almost struck out. Yeah. And. I don't know, like I, I, like I think David or David almost said David Kwan. <laughs> I mean, you can honestly combine those two, and those two would be a powerhouse. But oh my god, yeah. <laughs> but Stephen Stephen Kwan reminds me so much of a reincarnated Ichiro. Yeah. Like Ichiro retired, and then the baseball gods were like, "Oh, here's Stephen Kwan, just a yeah. basic, just a, the same, just the same yeah. exact player, yeah. minus minus like the speed a little bit, because Kwan is not as fast as Ichiro, but." Nah. The same and I'm pretty sure he's a righty. I think uh, Ichiro was lefty, so that's really the only difference. Quad's a lefty, too. Is he lefty? Oh, yeah, fuck. Then they're, yeah, better. <laughs> dude, they're, bo- they're both lefties, and the, neither one of them hit for power. They all just hit doubles, triples. <laughs> and you know what's funny? Lately, Quan has been getting some home runs. Like, yeah, I, I think he has, power. like, nine or ten on the season, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, and, like, that's – dude, that's added bonus because, you know, again – as a leadoff guy, you're not really expecting him to to have more than ten or twelve home home runs in a season. He already almost has ten all, all, already, you know. It's so, yeah. Listen, that's that's what we should expect from Yankees fans, though. Like that, that's how they are. That's how that fandom is. Lacking um, of baseball knowledge. Yeah, they they don't <laughs> care, and they don't understand the game. Um, but I mean, besides Quan, you know, Fry had a go. He literally had the go ahead. RBI hit late mm. and you know in that game that really sealed the deal and obviously class a I mean that that dude has That's one of the nastiest he has one of the nastiest cutters in baseball right now it's ridiculous like he's he's honestly he's getting above Kluber's like prime status when Kluber was throwing like 90 mile per hour cutters this dude's almost throwing 100 mile per hour cutters that's how deadly that shit is he is he, he's touching uh i went to a game two weeks ago and he touched 101 his cutter touched 101 that and dude that is a scary ball to hit like and, and his sliders at 92 93 and that's scary too because sliders move way more like cutters will move a little bit up a little bit but sliders depending on how his slider moves it can it either go like it's either side you know it's it's as i decided or it's corner to corner and his so is- I think his is more almost looks like of a curveball. It, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't go like straight up and down, but like 
it like it'll arch a little bit more yeah it'll arch a little bit more but it's still like fucking disgusting and and then guess what what you know when he wants to throw heat heat it's always 100 plus like it's always 101 102 and that's scary man e even above 97 is freaking above 90 is freaky for a normal human being so for yeah. him to be throwing that consistently every time well, he goes for saves that's why nobody can hit him well and that's the thing too is like he has a two. He only has two pitches in his arsenal. Mm -hmm. Two pitches. That's a cutter and a slider. That's his only two pitches he ever throws. Yeah. He doesn't throw no four seam fastball. He doesn't throw a two seam. He doesn't throw a changeup. He doesn't throw a curveball. He, he just has a cutter and a slider, and that's it. That's and he's the most effective because he could throw that cutter all triple digits, and, and if then it he ain't throws, broke. Don't fix it, and that yeah, that's his philosophy. He, that's the way it goes. It, yeah, and he has a six slider that's 93, as fast as some people's fastballs. I mean, because, like, you got to think about some of the best closers to ever play in the game, you know? Oh, you yeah. think of Rivera. Mm -hmm. Rivera didn't have a whole lot in the arsenal, but he was consistent every time. You have Chapman, who was known for his speed. That yeah. dude would throw 104, 106. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are. You're not hitting that. Um, you know, and there's been many other local losers over the years that they're either known for speed or they just have some of the nastiest shit in their arsenal and it's impossible to hit, you know, and of course you even have starting guys like that. I mean, I, w I would say one of my favorites was Tim Wakefield, uh, yeah. for the old Red Sox. He threw the nastiest knuckleball that I've ever seen because it would only go 45 miles an hour, but it would move with the wind because of it. And it was impossible to hit, and you literally had to have a bucket as a mitt in order to catch it because of how much it moved. Um, you know, so it's always always fun when guys they have that that niche in their arsenal that is literally their go like their go to. Like you know, I'm gonna throw it, and you're still gonna go out swinging because yeah. you can't hit it. Good luck. And when club <laughs> when class A is on. He's disgusting, and I'm yeah. really glad that we've found a way to keep him and extend him. I hope we never trade him, really, because, I mean, he's what we wanted Andrew Miller to be, and, I mean, Andrew Miller in 2016 was goaded. That that dude also had some of the nastiest shit ever, and it was more because of his release, how just long he was. He was like Randy Johnson yeah. In the bullpen, pretty much, and he wasn't really speed. It was just his shit moved from side to side, and it was impossible to hit. Um, so when you have the ability to, to to have that in your arsenal, it's special, and that's the advantage that the Guardians have, and that's why we have the best bullpen in baseball. It's a lot to do with Class A being able to close games out. Mm -hmm. He doesn't blow a lot of games. You know, I know last year he had a few blows, but. He's right now, he is about as on as he's ever been. And it's it goes back to confidence. Um, with baseball, it is such a mental game that, like, when you're on, man, there is nobody that stops you, truly. Like, and th th that's what I hope guys like McKenzie can find again. I hope Logan Allen can find that because they're, they're still special players. They're still good yeah. ball players. They're just lacking a little bit of confidence. Um, or they just need a little bit more work because they're still young. Uh, but again, that's why the Guardians have the best farm system in Bay Baseball, and we talked about that last week. And speaking of farm, might as well bring this one up too. Um, the Guardians nailed, and I mean nailed, that first round pick, that first overall pick. It was Zana or nothing. It, it, it was him or nothing, and I'm so glad that we got him because. This dude has the potential to be better than guys like Lindor ever could have dreamed of because they didn't have the hype that this kid has right now. And guess what? He's from Australia. Out of all places that the best player in this draft could have been from, he's from Australia. You wouldn't think that. You always think Dominican Republic, you know, because they always have great ball, you know, ball players. You're thinking uh, China, Japan right now. Um Australia's next, I guess, because this, this yeah. kid is a freak. He's one of the best hitters I think I've seen come out of uh, college ball right now. And he's just so disciplined and he's so open to, you know, adapting. And that's what you want out of a young kid like that. So um, I don't know about you, 
I'm fucking excited uh, for when that when that time comes because you're not gonna see him now, but maybe next year that that could be a legit possibility, especially with how the middle of the infield is looking right you know right now. You could move a him you know a Jimenez over to shortstop. You 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 can keep Schneem in there if you really like Schneem in there. Uh, there's options, and Rokio isn't gonna be one of them. I'm gonna tell you that right now. And if the Guardians are going to look to make some sort of trade, a guy like him may be on the block, uh, along with some, you know, other names as well. Because, as I said before, we need, you know, starting pitching. So, uh, to go back to, uh, you know, Zana, what do you think about the, you know, the pick? Uh, you know, I know you kind of both agree agree with me here, where we think this guy is just a general talent in the making. Dude, I for. The long leading up to the draft, I first thought they were going to go with JJ Weatherholt because I know that was like the name buzzing around a lot. And I was like, don't get me wrong, Weatherholt's a great player, yeah, but not what we wanted, not what we needed. I think the two clear choices was either Charlie Condon or Travis Bazana. I think yeah. those were the two clear cut choices, and they doubled down and they went with Travis Bazana, which I was super stoked because I was like. Please either let it be Condon or Bazana. Like yeah. those are the only two I would be happy with, and exactly. and they went with Travis Bazana. And I mean, I'm looking at his college stats from this past <laughs> season. Unbelievable! Fucking ridiculous. unbelievable! His stats. Go ahead, share. Twenty eight home runs, sixty six ribbies, sixteen stolen bases. Mind you, his most stolen bases was in 2023 season. So last season he had. Uh, 36 stolen bases for Oregon State last year. Um, he only struck out 30 times, which is <laughs> nutty, which is Stephen Kwan esque. He struck out 30 times all college baseball season. Uh, he batted 405, actually, no, 407. Woo! So his batting average was beyond elite. He had a 568 uh, on base percentage, he had a 911 slugging percentage. His OPS, because obviously the OPS is the slugging and on-base percentage combined. His OPS was 1.479. He had 195 total bases. Um, He was hit five times. And yeah, I mean, this guy was just crazy. He had 16 doubles as well. He had four triples. 28 home point, runs. Point is, he's a crazy hitter. And... Point is, is he's ridiculous. <laughs> Like he's he's one of the best college athletes I think we've seen for for a while. I mean, it, it's been a mm-hmm. long time since I think we've seen like an actual college prospect be this hyped up, and there's yeah. a reason for it. And all of the coaches that I've heard uh, from Oregon that have talked, my goodness, have they have nothing but just incredible things to say. And I even saw his own interview about joining the ball club and him just being. So uh, appreciative of it, but also him, how excited he is to be a part of the farm that we have. And, and, you know, we talked about it last week. If he is going to find any success anywhere and and not get thrown to the wolves right away, it's going to be a team like this who's smart with, with the way that they develop players. And if you think this kid's good now, give him a year or two in the minors. And between him and guys like, man, you know, Manzardo, uh, you know, you know, Noel, we have so many guys that I'm just so excited to see what they can develop into. And we have that every year, but, uh, right now our farm system is looking crisp. And, uh, I know we also drafted a ridiculous amount of, of pitching as well, which listen, Mm. you can never have too much pitching. So I'm totally fine with them doing that. I know they drafted a catcher pretty high as well. A few other miscellaneous guys, but I mean, a ton of pitching that they drafted this draft. Um, you know, and I know the draft in baseball, it's a lot, lot different than it is for football and basketball because not only are you trying to fill the Guardians row roster, you're also, you know, having to fill up your, what, four or five minor league teams total. I mean, yeah. we have Columbus, Akron, uh, I forget what our single what, A, A, uh, A one County. is. Lake Lake County kick captains. I think they also have they have one more. I think mm-hmm. that's that's around around the, that as well. Uh, the uh, Lynchburg Hillcats. Yeah. Which so is before, I mean, which, yeah, which is before yeah. Lake County. 
so like you're you're filling all of those rosters. Yeah. So it's not it's not just one roster that you know that you feel like you know I know with uh, NBA now you actually obviously have the G League, which is a lot more beneficial for them than say what the NFL has, where it's just scouting team and them just kind of being on practice squad or you know you know something like that. You're not having to throw them to to the wolves. You're able to do, develop them. So. I'm really curious to see where they start him out out with. I'm really curious to see, um, you know, I know you mentioned I, you know, that you would love to see him, you know, go to like Akron and go straight to just double A and just see how, how early mm-hmm. you, you know, can get him up. Uh, I'm really curious to see what the rules are behind that. I didn't really look that up and I wish I did. Um, but regardless, it is a generational pick. Um and with this team playing as good as they are right right now, it is going to be interesting, to say the least, to to see where this team looks like in a year or two from now. Um, what's also crazier too is that I think it's the first five players the Guardians drafted. So Bazana and like the four pitchers they drafted after, I think someone said the Guardians' top five picks that they got this year in the draft are going to be within the top 50 prospects list of this year. Yeah. Which is which is insane. So that's four that's four pitchers who are in the top 50 with Travis Bazana who can play second base, left field and center field. So you have a guy who can play in the outfield and second, which means you're probably going to move Jimenez back to short. Yeah. And you're going to use Bazana as the second baseman or unless you train Bazana to be the shortstop and leave Jimenez at second. And, you know, you can stick Schneeman back out in the outfield and let him be the center field instead of Tyler Freeman. And, oh, my God, dude, what a lineup that is. Well, and, and, you, and even having Martinez right now playing, you know, Angel Martinez has been first, killing it. He's been killing it in the outfield. Like, you know, he's hitting the ball well, but he's also – he's made a play like every game he's played, I feel like, yeah. in the outfield. So – that also gives you you confidence as well. It just again, we have plenty of guys. Like, you know, I know there's a lot of talk with, with people in terms of the moves that we still want to make. As mm-hmm. I have a freaking motor says, so that could pull blaring its shit behind me. But, um, you know, I know I know people want you know a new shortstop. I know people want you know help in the infield and outfield. But truly, I think the only thing that the Guardians need to worry about in terms of trades right now is pitching. Starting pitching, yeah. go get yourself a legit guy to pair with the three that are going to pitch this week, mm-hmm. uh, which is the next thing that I want to discuss here. So, obviously, we've had a few days now with the All-Star game and stuff. Um, yeah. Guards are back tomorrow. Uh, mm-hmm. They start a three-game series against the D-backs and then follow that up with a four-game series against the Phillies. Um, so, I think this week we have Bivey, Lively, and Williams, which I think... It's really your top three guys right right now in you know in the starting pitching mm-hmm. rotation right now, um. So it's a good opportunity for the guards to not only have good pitching but also get themselves back on track. You know the D the, you know the D backs they were good lot last year. They've sort of regressed. They've had a lot of you know injuries and stuff this year. I think so. Um, what is sort of the mindset for you right now in terms of? what the focus should be because there was a little bit of a slump there towards the end of the first half of this, you know, CC season before the all, the all-star break, but now we're back and we got a good row, you know, rotation to start. Everybody should be hitting the ball better. What's, what's the mindset that you feel like they should be having going into this right now? Because we have a hard schedule ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the all-star break first and foremost came at the right time because we were starting to do, trend downward. So I, I think having the all-star break when it happened was just perfect time because in the last 10 games, we went four and six in the last 10 games. So we were, we were starting to struggle a little bit and now you have, because now we play starting tomorrow. Like you said, we're, we're actually playing the Padres for three games. So we play San Diego tomorrow through Sunday. Yep. And then we have a four game series against Detroit at home. Then we travel to Philly, and then we travel to Detroit for two games against Detroit, which is our last two games against Detroit. So, like you said, the end of the month, you got some stiff cup, but San Diego is a good team to get back on track because they're 
500. They're 15 49. So this is a good opportunity to be at home, get back on track, get some wins on the board, get yourself feeling good again. And like you said, you have the three pitchers. Tomorrow's Tanner Bybee, and you're going up against Matt Waldron tomorrow, yeah. which Waldron, I don't know if you know much about him, but he's like the Tim Wakefield of the Padres. Okay. He's he's a, he's basically a knuckleball kind of sicko freak in nature. I also think he has a couple other pitches too. I think he does throw like a fastball here and there, and he might have like a slider or, or curve, but mm-hmm. he, he is known for his knuckleball, and he can throw a good one. But he won't throw it every time like Tim Wakefield does. He'll he'll mix it in there somewhere in some of these pitches. But you have Tanner Bybee going tomorrow against Waldron. I think it'll be a good game. And then you have again, you have your series against Philly and then or Detroit and then Philly and then Detroit again. Mm-hmm. This is this is just a time to get back on track. Everyone had a great week off, essentially. You needed the all-star break, you needed the rest. And this is the time to for vote to go to the locker room. Listen, guys, we got our break. I know we slumped in the last 10 games. We went four and six. Let's take a deep breath. Let's get back out there and let's go win some more ball games. Because mm-hmm. now you have the third toughest schedule in the second half. So you you need to keep up the wins and get them where you can because now's the tough tough portion of the season you started off oh, with yeah. the easy schedule you started off with the easy teams now you have to face the brunt you you play maybe a team if you make the world series this is probably the team you're going to be playing you play yeah. the phillies next weekend and that could be the world series preview and you play them in philly so it's not like it's going to be an easy time and now's a chance to go there show them hey listen we're fucking legit we're real we're the real deal we came here we're not gonna fuck around we're gonna go out there we're gonna beat the shit out of you and like you said we we have a team now where if we can just go out and get some kind of pitching maybe one one good solid pitcher and then maybe one that's decent enough until boyd comes into play this team is gonna be legit and i know we We've been talking about Garrett Crochet and Eric Fetty and these guys. Now's the time to go get them. If you get them, hey, big thumbs up, man. You're, we're we're going to be good for the second half. And I, I think if I'm Bo, I'm going in, into that front office and saying, listen, I know you saw what happened before the All-Star break. We were slumping. Our pitching was horrific. Mm-hmm. Like, please... Please. Get me some we, fucking help. Yeah. We have 12 days until the deadline is over. Yeah. Please give me some fucking pitching. And I'm not talking about going to the dollar bin and giving me another whatever the guy pitched the other day. Yeah. Please not another one of those. Legit, give up a prospect or two and get me a good pitcher. I beg you. Like, we just want some pitching. Like, a legit pitcher. And then we could add Matthew Boyd into the rotation. I took I be, while we were discussing Travis Pizzano, I was also looking up Logan Allen in AAA. He pitched his first game on the 13th, so last weekend. He went six innings, gave up two runs, one earned. He gave up a home run, which is that earned run. Walked one or two batters, but then struck out eight people. Yeah, he's probably going to come back up, I bet. So he he looked solid in his debut in Columbus. Mackenzie, on the other hand, is looking like he's struggling a little bit. He got beat up in his first game pretty badly. The second game, he looked a little bit better. But again, still got six, seven strikeouts. But again, still gave up like four runs. Mm -hmm. So I think for Mackenzie, it's cool on the runs. (laughs) Just focus on getting... Don't worry about striking people out. Just get outs. Keep Again, it around two to three max. Like yeah. if we, like, like like if we can get your runs down to about two to three max, um, you know that's a pretty good ERA to have comparative to to a four or five. You know, yeah. and even if you're striking out nine guys, um, if you're only able to go four or five innings within that nine strikeouts, that that it's not doing in enough the because there there's still so much mm-hmm. of a wild card that could happen in between that fifth inning and then the ninth inning. 
and you you really just have to make sure that you give your bull your bullpen enough of rest to be able to get guys like Cla you know Clase in to finish it out when you know when we're up, and if you can do that, then you've 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 secured your spot. So yeah, I totally agree. I, I think I think Vogue needs to kind of demand a little bit of like hey, you know I, I know this really wasn't the plan, but this is the team we have right now, and this is a damn good team. We can't waste this. We can't waste yeah. the opportunity to potentially go to a World Series. You gotta go get some more help with the starting row, you, you know, rotation. And I fully expect him to bring back up Logan Allen. But yeah. in the meantime, I think you need to find a way to get another starting pitcher. So that way, when you do bring up a, Lo- a Logan Allen, you can put Carrasco in the bullpen to help. Yeah. And I think that would be way more beneficial than going out and trading for a bullpen guy. Like we've heard talk about that we talked yeah. about last week. I just think that would make way more sense because Correct Rasko is much better in his first two or three innings, you know, have, having to pitch anyway. So he's one of those guys that you you can throw in for an inning or two and he'll it he'll eat innings for you, and that's that's what you need. So we'll see what they do, but I do agree. Vogue needs to kind of demand a little bit uh, out of this front office. Uh, but yeah, you know, again, we we have a pretty tough schedule and that. That series against uh, the Phillies, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a bar setter because it's gonna be early on in this you know second stage of this season. Um, if you can take, if you can split the series two to two, if you can take that series, that's that's big right there, because then that proves to to the media, hey, we can beat the best. Like no matter who they put out there, we can beat the best. We, we like we may not always do it, but we can be be the best, and we will beat the best. And when it comes down to the playoff time, that's where we're gonna need it to shine. Um, this Guardians team is, is built to win, but there's zero doubt about that. And if Vo doesn't kind of beg the front office to give him some more help, I think you're just doing him a disservice, and you're also you're you're sort of wasting a super team, I guess, that we have right now with this Guardians team. This is some of the best hitting that I think this team will ever have. Like it's been a long time since since we've had this good of hitting. I would argue since the nineties. Yeah. You know, the ninety five team specifically. I mean that one through nine spot, man, whoo that team was vicious. And I'm so mad that I was not even a year old when they were around. <laughs> but uh, that team, just historically speaking, was dynamic. This team has a potential to be that, so you can't waste that. You, you just you can't. No, you you absolutely can't waste this team. And again, we talked about this before. This is like 2016 all over again, where you realize like, oh shit, we have this great team and this great roster, and we can go all the way. And that's when they went and got out Andrew Miller, and they got rid of a few prospects and went out and got Miller. Yeah. And it's like, this is what we need to do again. Yeah. Go out there, give a team a couple of your good, great prospects that you have. And be like, listen, we need your best pitcher or at least you're a solid pitcher from you. And that's where you go to a defeated team like the White Sox. Hey, give us Garrett Crochet. Yeah. Hey, give us Eric Fetty. One of them, we will take them. And we will give you two, maybe three prospects for them. We need one of them now. And you can go to Toronto. You can get, I think they're, one of their top pitches is Chris Bassett. And again, it's one of those situations where you go up to them and say, hey, listen, we we need you. Yeah, it's Bassett. Um Again, these are guys who are pitching five, six innings. And Bassett has right now a 350, 340, 3, 350 ERA right now. And his last game, he went seven, seven innings. He went six innings, gave up three runs, and struck out six. And I think they won or something. So you can go to Toronto, get Bassett. You can go to Chicago and get crochet. There's there's options. And those teams are struggling now to where they might sell you someone. If you give them a decent couple pieces 
So you have to go into the front office and say, hey, listen, this team we got is stacked. We're the second best team in baseball. But we cannot live off of Carlos Carrasco. We cannot live off of Tristan McKenzie right now. We cannot live off of a struggling Logan Allen who we sent down to get his confidence back because I think it's just confidence for him at, right now. And we definitely can't get the, these guys that we're just picking yeah. up on waivers and shit that are just giving us two innings in the starting spot and giving up six runs in two innings. Like, it's yeah. come on, man. We like can't, we, can't, we can't rely on that shit. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I get it. The Dolans are probably like, listen, you guys are scoring runs, so we figured this was okay. Like, like again, that's understandable. We're scoring a shit ton of runs. But you can't be afraid to give up some prospects, man. You can't. You can't be... Like, the thing is, you can't hoard people. Yeah. If the more you hoard people, yeah, the better your prospects are and the better that... But, They may again, never get a, a, a shot at the big leagues if you can't. In the you know? so since the minor leagues were introduced, there's like there's something that I saw earlier, and um, it shows you like how many prospects like the team has, and how mm-hmm. many of them like reached the MLB yeah. in the last like fifty some odd years or something. And all the teams were like, "Oh, we've had like 400, 300, whatever." And then you see how many made it to the majors and actually got to play like in one major league game. For the Guardians, it was like 380 prospects, and only like 60 of them made it to the majors. Yeah. And it was like 6% of the prospects made it to the majors. Like, the rest of them stay in the minors and just play their whole careers in the minors. Yeah. So it's like... It's sad, man. It sucks. Like, and that's the thing. That's why you can't hoard these players, because these guys probably will never come up. So you might as well get rid of them. For someone better in the majors who's going to help you now. We're not saying you need to spend Yankee or Dodger money on these people. But that's where you go and you get, again, a guy. Both Crochet and Bassett's uh, contracts are really nice right now. I think they're free agents next year. They're on low deals. Yep. Now is the chance to get them on a quick cheap and ride them to the playoffs. And that helps Bybee. That helps Williams, that helps Lively. Now you have a fourth pitcher and like a crochet again, a crochet or Bassett. Even if you get their secondary pitchers from both of those teams, the Chicago White Sox, if you get Eric Fetty or if you get Kikuchi from Toronto, yeah. those guys will help you out. And then you could bring up Allen, or they might keep Allen down and they might bring up a, or they, and they might wait for Boyd to get back from injury. Or do you bring up Allen and make him your fifth? Yeah. And let Boyle or Boyd get healthy for the playoffs. And then you throw Carrasco into the bullpen. Yeah. And there's your five. Because now the pressure's off of Allen. The pressure's off of Carrasco because now Carrasco doesn't have to worry about going trying to go six innings. Even though I think his last two starts, he actually did go six innings in both of those starts. So he actually kind of picked it up a little bit in his last couple of games he's pitched. Yeah. I definitely want to check that out. But um but it's at least you, you you don't need to go out and get two guys, just one guy, someone who's really solid. Yeah, I mean, we just need one. Like we yeah. don't we don't need a shit ton of guys. We just need one, because I think you can ride out guys like Bybee and Lively and Williams alone with those three guys right there. And if you bring up Allen again, that you know that's four. And then if you yeah. can get one more up, that's five. And then if McKenzie comes back, say he's not fully ready, if you want to throw him in the bull in the bullpen, that, you know, that that's fine. I don't care what ends up happening, but we need to do something because that's the only struggle that this team has. Not and, gonna lie, and, what's kind of great too is I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, what's great. What's great now is I looked up Carlos Carrasco's stats. In the last five games, he's actually gone six innings. Yeah. Like, and he's been playing phenomenal. Yeah, he, he went... For what he is. Yeah, against his last game against Toronto, he went six innings. Then he went five against Baltimore. Then six against Chicago. Five against San Francisco. And then his last game against Tampa Bay, he went five. Yeah. Only given up three. His most runs he given up was three. Yeah. So, I mean, even if you're only getting five out of Carrasco... He's only giving up two or three runs. That's not bad. That's fine. And, the, and okay. like I said, 
the last five games, he's actually gone six innings. Yeah. So he's give he's giving you the innings now. You just have to again. This is the part where you just need one pitcher. Yeah. And then Carrasco's pitching fine now, which again, you could keep that gives you the opportunity to get Logan Allen some more time in the minors. Get him maybe three, four, or five games in the minors. And then when he's ready to go in the middle of September, you can bring up Logan Allen, let him get some minor league ga- or major league games again. And then, boof, playoff time. Mm-hmm. And then, you have, again, you have Matthew Boyd, who was one of the aces for Detroit, which you took him away, which is actually nice because Matthew Boyd's actually solid. Yeah. But last year, he tore his, he had to get Tommy John surgery, so he's out until, I think, like the end of July. Okay. Early August. So he he's going to be back. I, I'll have to double check, but if you can go ahead and finish your point, I know you're trying to make. No, but, like, I mean, yeah. Again, all we need is one, and I, yeah. I feel like you you can still fill out the roster even if guys are going to come you know come back like Boyd, like McKenzie. I mean, I get why they wouldn't make a move because maybe they bank on some of those guys coming back and and and, and playing well, but it's still a gamble. And at least with Allen, you know that the guy can give you innings and he can win you games because he's he's. He didn't have a bad, you know, you know, record before he got sent down. So it's not like he was playing horrible or anything. He just, he needs a little more time in the minors. He he he's not going to be a bad guy for us. Um, but with McKenzie struggling, with Shane Bieber out, I mean that if Shane Bieber isn't out, this isn't even a discussion. And then you're talking about filling the middle of the field, and you're you're filling up another batter set up. Then you know you you don't really need. Or if you want to go get a, bull, a bullpen guy, then you could do that. But you don't have that right now, so you need to make a decision uh, on w- winning right now because this this team can win right now. So that's my biggest point. Uh, we've been saying that for weeks. We will see what they do. I know you said trade dead deadline is only in, uh, another like what ten days left, so there's not a lot of time now. So hopefully they use the all the All Star break to kind of start to go. You you know trying to just talk to teams and see what the asking price is for some of these guys. And just kind of going from there and really working through it because it seems like the Guardians players are trying to recruit guys like a, um, you know, like a crochet or, you know, somebody like that. Um, so the players want it. Why not give it to them? Um, so, yeah, that, that that's pretty much my final, final thoughts on that. I really don't have anything else to speak on that. Um, um, so I got an update on Boyd. Okay. Um. When we signed Boyd, we put him on the 15-day uh, injured list. Yeah. And as of yesterday, Boyd began rehab assignment Tuesday, which is yesterday, actually yesterday. Okay. Well, even though the, well, the article came out yesterday, so on the 16th, he began rehab assignment in the rookie-level Arizona Complex League, covering okay. three innings, striking out seven. Woo! While, okay. allowing it, while allowing one unearned run on three hits and a walk. All right. Hey. That that makes me feel better, okay. Because if Boyd can come up, and he and he can get to this team by let's say beginning of September or even late August, it gives yeah. him enough time to work in. And if he becomes a, a end of the rotation guy, oh god, that's beautiful. Yeah, as because long as he then, continues to do what he's doing, like again, that was his first game back from Tommy John was on Tuesday. Yeah, it's thir- th- right now. It's Thursday. For those who don't know, we record on Thursdays mostly. But he he started Tuesday. He's in the Arizona League right now. He just pitched his first game, three innings, seven Ks, one unearned run. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So I mean great news. <laughs> and if that's the case, if he ends up becoming a top three guy for us, then it makes you decide, okay, mm-hmm. do we want to put Lively in the bull, you know, in the bullpen? You know, do you want to put Gavin in the bullpen? Whatever you want to do. I mean, I, I think, think Gavin's can... a starting pitch or regardless. But I'm saying keep, for for you know for playoff time. I think you keep both of those guys in the starting rotation. <laughs> I think I to. I think your rotation is Bybee, Williams, Lively, Boyd, and then whoever you decide to trade for, like Crochet or Bassett, like that's your fifth. Yeah. And then if you want to keep Logan Allen, then you can throw a Carrasco in the bullpen. If you want Allen in the bullpen, you can throw him in the bullpen. Yeah, and then now you have two guys in the bullpen who 
again, if, if somebody gets injured, you need them to start. They're both ready to start regardless. Yeah. And you can get rid of the two worst guys in the bullpen. But right now, you don't even need to get rid of them because the, mm-hmm. the bullpen are phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. So, again, we'll see what happens. We'll we'll see how guys are starting to mm-hmm. look, uh, you know, at least through the end of this month. Uh, because come August, that's when crunch time starts to happen. Like, yeah. that's when teams need to start locking up what they want this roster to be. Uh, because you're then fighting for a, you know, a playoff spot. And, you know, the Guardians are obviously at the top of that list in terms of playoff spots. Um, but there's going to be, uh, you know, other teams that are kind of on that bubble. They're kind of fighting a little bit right now. This is when they're going to play better. So that's why this schedule is going to be even tougher for us. So yep. July 31st, end of the, uh, is the deadline day. Okay. July so 31st. yeah, I mean, we got, so we did almost two weeks until that happens yep. about 10 days, roughly. Yeah. So it, it's, it's coming down to the wire. Uh, it, it, it really is. But um, I wanted to end this podcast on a fun thing that we, or I should say Andrew, found. Uh, I don't know if it was er- it was earlier today or not. It was yesterday is when this came out. Yep. Uh, FanDuel put out a power rankings for the NFL teams right now, you know, before the year starts. And Andrew, I'm going to go ahead and let you tell the people – <laughs> who is in front of the Browns and how big of a disrespect this is? Because when you told me this, I didn't even have words. I was just like, what the fuck are they doing over there? Like, is FanDuel bored? Because think, these power rankings so. are awful. So go ahead and tell the people who's in front of the Browns right now. So for context, the Browns are in 20 sec. The, the FanDuel has in their power rankings for the NFL, FanDuel put the Browns at 22 which is already ridiculous to begin with 22 after five after playing five quarterbacks last year making the playoffs having a number one defense number one defense almost uh coming second in the division and winning 11 games FanDuel decided we were deserving of the 22nd spot in their power rankings above us in front of us already in front of us it's the new york giants which is already like I want to bring up last year's standings too, so that way, go ahead. We 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 have some context here. Give the people what they want. Oh, I'm giving the fucking people what they want. <laughs> so, so for context, the New York Giants were six and eleven last year. They're ranked. They're ranked ahead of us at twenty first. They're ranked above us, and mind you, they got rid of Saquon Barkley to the Eagles, so they don't even have the their best running back anymore. He's gone now to Philly. Above them. Is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Who now, went, mind what, you, nine and eight or eight or eight and nine, nine last year. Nine and eight and yep. went to the playoffs. Um, and I think they actually won their first playoff game too, if I remember correctly. To my uh, I, I can't remember. Um, above them, the LA Chargers at nineteen. And mind you, the Chargers finished. Where the Chargers go? They finished five and twelve. And I think they'll be about there again. I, yeah, with Harbaugh in his first year. 18, they had Jacksonville Jaguars. And the Jaguars were 9-8 and eight again. And the Browns smoked the Jaguars. We too. beat them. Yeah, and we beat them. At 17, they have the Falcons. And again, the Falcons finished 7-10 uh, and 10 last year. Now, granted, they do have Cousins. So mm-hmm. this team is, is theoretically supposed to be better. But if we're basing this strictly off of last year's stats right now, the Browns are twice as good. Yeah, but go ahead. Because uh, we got more bullshit ahead. This is like, going to get worse, by the way. Oh, here's the crazy part. 16 is the Pittsburgh Steelers. And What? It, what? <laughs> and what? Finished, no, don't get me wrong. They made the playoffs last year, finishing 10 to 7. So, uh, but if we're talking roster-wise and stats and everything else, the Browns wiped the Steelers clean. And I think the Browns roster is twice as good as the, the Steelers roster. And we don't even know if Russ is going to cook. But and, then the biggest disrespect is the one after that. Yeah. The biggest disrespect after that is the Chicago fucking Bears. Having a quarterback that hasn't played a down of NFL football yet. Yes, Caleb Williams. It, it's theoretically like he, he, he should be good, but he hasn't played it down. 
And to me, I think he's going to be a flop. Loki. I mean, I I've said that a few times. Um, I I, I agree. I I think he was going to be a flop too. And then they have Miami next after that. Yeah, they have Miami after that, which again I can understand Miami a little bit. Yeah, because Miami is kind of solid. Yeah, and they I mean they have little- Tyreek Hill. I mean, yeah, they had the same record as us too. Yeah. Um, the thirteen is the Seahawks, who again, yeah, they beat us, but we were right there with them. Like we we barely even lost to them, and they finished. Where did Seattle finish? They finished nine and eight. They even made the playoffs. Same as Tampa. So same as Tampa. And then they had the LA Rams, which okay makes sense. The LA Rams finished in a playoff position. They went ten and seven. They went to the playoffs. But they're but they they still don't have like an impeccable roster, and no. you really don't know how Stafford is going to play. You also don't know how guys are going to be in terms of their health because you know mm-hmm. Cooper Cup got hurt last year. Puka was starting to have some bang up injuries. You never know how he is going to be. I know Kyron is currently battling an injury right now as well. Uh, and Aaron Aaron Donald is eight. Well, he's retired now, so I mean, uh. You you've lost a significant piece of your defense. Um, the Rams are not going to be as as good as they were last year, in my opinion. Now the next team that is above them, Houston, I actually think should be higher on this list than eleven. Yeah, um, I, I I view them above a couple of guys that are in front of them because at ten is Buffalo, and to me Buffalo is gonna. Be not as good. Yeah, you have Josh Allen, but they don't have anybody to throw to. They they lost Diggs. They lost Gabe Davis. The only one you have is Kincaid, really. Yeah. Also, and, too, I just want to say this too: if the Browns were in the AFC East, the Browns would have won that division. Oh, by by a landslide too. It wouldn't well, even been a contest. Well, the Dil- the Dolphins and the Bills were both eleven to six as we were, but based on um. Based on the tiebreakers and stuff, the Browns would have been number one. Yeah. So, so then that's for so context. Then, so yeah. So you have Bills at ten, then you have Green Bay at nine, and I don't I think mean, Green Bay. I don't think Green Bay is a bad team, and I do think they they theoretically should be better this year. I but don't think they're a top ten team. They're not a top ten team. Um, you still don't know if Jordan Love is going to have another good year. Or if he's gonna decrease because he had, he had his first really good year last year, okay? Yeah. Does he regress or does he progress? But putting them above Buffalo is fine. I think Houston and Green Bay should be switched at the very least. Mm-hmm. I think Houston is it's a legitimate top ten team. I think Stroud is ridiculous. They just got digs. Mm-hmm. They obviously have, you know, a, a really solid offense and they improved their defense. Houston's gonna be scary. Houston, Houston will be a scary team. Houston's going to be ridiculous. Um, yes. Th- then they have the Eagles at eight, which, again, I felt was a little disrespectful to the Eagles. That should be flipped with the Jets or even the Bengals, where where the Bay Bengals are right now. But we're, we're not quite there yet. So seven is Dallas. Yes. Um. Again. And then, well, yeah, Dallas, again, 12 and, 12 and 5, I think they finished. Yeah. But do they – really I mean Philadelphia people. is going to destroy that whole division I think. Yeah. I mean I don't, after I getting I don't think I don't think Dallas impresses people at no. all. Especially when we are are going to probably kill them week 1. Yeah. Um, um then you have this is again this is where it's to get crazy again. Then you have the Jets at 6. And mind you the Jets finished 7 and 10 and if Aaron Rodgers doesn't play, that's where they're going to be again. Yeah. So they're, if they're not, really just if not worse. They're they're really basing this off of Aaron Rodgers, and they're like, well, Aaron Rodgers, they're a top five, they're a top six team, top ten team. I mean, I, I even if they're, I mean, I even if they're wondering, or even betting on Devonte Adams getting traded to New York. Yeah, and that's in another this situation. Too. Because they're, they're, that's they're the only on that way too. that they like. That's the only way that they even get to six or even top five for that matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, A Rod's the god. A Rod is one of the best quarterbacks I that I've seen in my generation. But 
the the Jets still don't have a crazy crazy team. They don't have a crazy o you know o line that's going to be mm-hmm. their weak point. Their team, their defense. Obviously, they have Sauce, so they have one of the top corners. They have a decent defense, uh, and I I do think they are coached well. But beyond Garrett Garrett Wilson, who the fuck else do you have on that offense to throw to? I mean, you yeah. have Brees Hall, uh, who's an outstanding you know running back, and I think he's going to do great, especially in fantasy. But again, you're basing entirely off of if Rodgers can even have a better year. You don't know if he's going to regress or not. He's over 40 years old now. So again, you, you're you just basing it off of what we know of Aaron Rodgers and not what he will be. And that goes next. Because after New York is the Bengals. And we've said this a couple times on this podcast. And I'll, and I'll let you chime in on, you know, on, on this too, obviously. I don't think Burrow is 100%. I've heard he's not 100%. And I don't think this team is going to be much better than they already have been. They're not even going to win the division, in my opinion. I think it's going to come down to Ball Baltimore or the Browns. Because we're just a more complete team. And Ball Baltimore is a more complete team. The Bengals are still going to struggle because they're going to struggle to keep Burrow alive. So, yeah. Bengals at five. What the fuck are they thinking? I think I think everyone just rates it because of Joe Burrow and Chase yeah. and Jamar Chase. And it's... It's crazy because, again, they base it off of two people, but how do we know? How do we know if anything's going to. I don't know. It's it's just beyond me. Like, again, it's one of those things where I don't have any words. And I, I don't think Joe Burrow is going to survive. And I mean, they're like, players like LaShawn McCoy are like. They're obviously they're dismissing like the injuries to Joe Burrow and, and he's looking I, I, again. They're like, oh well, Joe Burrow is looking to um put the injury trouble behind him. LeSean McCoy's latest on Joe Burrow would take the or would make the Bengals happy. Like his latest take will make the Bengals happy and um like Mike Hilton, the corner for the Bengals is saying he looks confident in his throwing ability. He looks to get his starting swag back. He's starting to get his swag back. Like, I think everyone's just saying this within the Bengals organization and locker just to dismiss the fact that Joe Burrow is not a hundred percent and they don't want people to be afraid or know. And I don't think people remembered what happened last year when we played Bengals week one when we just ran through their O line, and it it didn't look good for for Cincy. And now I know they drafted the young kid from Georgia in the first round of the draft. They're I think he's a center, and he's solid, but that's like the only upgrade you made on the offensive line. And you don't even know, and he's a rookie. And you don't even know if he's going to be good. Mm-hmm. And I think they signed. I think they signed uh, Orlando Brown, too, from Baltimore. Yeah, uh, they but did last year. Last he, year. He, and he was on Kansas City before they did that, yeah. Yeah, and he was... I mean, he wasn't anything spectacular last year. Like, he just no stopping Miles Garrett, no stopping Zadarius Smith, no stopping Jock, no stopping anybody. And then... The the rest of the list obviously pans out. Obviously, you have the Lions at four, the 49ers at three, the Ravens at two, and the Chiefs at one. Yeah. The, 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 that makes sense. The top four makes sense. Yeah. Like, I have no issues with the top four. No. I don't have much issues with the bottom half either. I think everyone is where they're supposed to be. Yeah, I mean, I think the Broncos are going to be the worst team in the league this year. That is no doubt. I think the Chargers are, are going to end up being a little lower. Um, mm-hmm. because I personally think they're going to end up trading Herbert at some point, whether it be at trade rate deadline or at the end of the year. From what I hear, Har- Harbaugh just isn't really a fan of him. No. Um, you know, in the Pats, I mean, they're a wild card because you never know if the new coaching staff and the new quarterback is going to play up to par. But I, I think you're just under the assumption that they're going to struggle. Yeah. And, you know, the Panthers, I know they really... I think I think the Panthers will actually do better than the Titans. 
Um, and I think the Cardinals will be above the Vikings here. <laughs> um, I would even see Washington as well. Isn't going to be that, that bad. Uh, the Saints, they're going to be interesting. I don't know what the fuck to think about the Saints. Um, and same with the Raiders. Um, yeah, I, I just... There's a level of disrespect in the media with the Browns. And, and it's always been there. You know, so we're... Like, yeah. as Browns fans, we're both used to it. But, dude. This is definitely gonna, is definitely going to weigh something up in the Browns. Because they're going to look at what the media is saying. Obviously, they're going to look at what... FanDuel said, and they're going to be like, oh, so okay. everyone everyone is supposedly doing what they did last year, and they're just down the hell out of us, and they don't think we're going to be good, so we'll just go 11-6 and six again, yeah. maybe 12-5, and five, have the best defense in the league, and... Maybe you know, even win the hardest division in football. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, it... Again, it really depends on the health of these other teams. If Baltimore comes out and Lamar's not doing well, or say Derrick Henry doesn't do well, or... One of these Oops. teams are going to deal with injuries because last year it was us. The year before that, it was Baltimore. You know, the Bengals had a ton of injuries. There, it just, dude, it just depends on how things go, it, and it could happen to us as well. It obviously happened to us last year, but we still found a way to win eleven games with five quarterbacks playing. So, we have. I just, I don't know how you can put the Browns at twenty-two when they literally have the best defense in the league. And guess what? They fucking made it better than they had last year. Yeah. We upgraded the players that struggled or were meh, and we upgraded them. Also, don't forget, too, for the Ravens, we also took up their best backup quarterback in Tyler Huntley. So I think people forget about that as well. Because their backups are, let's see, as of right now listed, the backups are Josh Johnson and uh, Emery Jones. Yeah. Who? <laughs> yeah. Like we we literally took Tyler Huntley away from them, their best backup, and we still have DTR. Like, so everyone's concerned with like Deshaun Watson. Okay, cool. We still have two solid backups behind him. Yeah. So that way we don't have to go through six different fucking quarterbacks again. But you know. And and also we you know we have these quarterbacks because let's say a team is gonna need a quick starter or, or somebody that needs to step in because somebody else got, got, got hurt and, you know, in, in camp, you have a Huntley, you have a, uh, you know, Jameis, you have, you yeah, know, yeah, D, I forgot about you. I mean, you even have a D, you know, a DTR, if you really do want to get rid of him, if you feel like he's just not going to be the guy, but oh, yeah. above all else, like, I mean, I know obviously you're going to agree with me here on this, but, I think Watson's gonna have a really good year this year. He's he's yeah. he has all the things he needs, and he's coming into the year healthier than he has been. He has zero outside distractions. He is strictly focused on football. There is nothing hindering him at this point. And another thing too that I didn't mention that I want to mention. You and I said this months ago when we talked first about you know Chubb's injury. Seeing him get that uh, video of him squatting five five forty again on the wiggle rack, I have a hot take. I think he's starting week one. I I think after seeing that, I, I dude, I think he may start week one. That video made me so happy. Like and, just watching Nick Chubb just bet or squat fucking five hundred was it five hundred and fifty pounds or or something? Yeah, like, but like insane. He, you and I even said, like, dude, I'm, I'm waiting for that. Like, you know, that's when I, you know, that, that that's when we're going to know he's he's getting there. Guess what? It's July 18th. That happened earlier than this week. He's got another month and a half or so until, uh, until the season starts. I'm telling you, he definitely wants to play week one. It's going to come down to do the Browns let him play week one. Because... He, he he did that without a knee brace. <laughs> like, that's not cool. That that's fucking scary. But like, dog, if he's doing that after ACL, MCL, and a meniscus tear, week one doesn't sound out of the table now. And uh, I don't want them to rush him back. But I'm saying if he's ready and he's cleared, 
Nick Chubb is going to fucking play. And oh, a thousand percent. Could you imagine this fucking stadium? Week one against Dallas. And out comes Nick Chubb. Because he, he last minute got cleared. And that crowd is going to go banana, <laughs> dude. They're going to go nuts. And they're going to pay the Dak Prescott. They're going to look at that time and be like, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck, yeah. Because <laughs> not only that, then the team's going to be turned. Because everybody's like, let's go. We got, you know, we got our, we boy, got our back. boy back. Yeah. And I'm telling you, the weather probably won't be that, that great because week one last year, it was rainy. It was gross. And it was and, like also like 50 degrees. It was also kind of chilly. Yeah. Like it was as Cleveland football weather as you as you could get in September randomly. And then and then we played and, Tennessee like the next week and it was like sunny, 75 degrees and perfect yeah, weather. Yeah, literally, yeah, literally week three or four, I think we had we had that. So yeah. Perfection. <laughs> um listen, my my final thoughts though on the rankings thing. First of all, it's just FanDuel's rankings. I don't really care. But honestly, like, even if I hear ESPN put us at, like, 18 or whatever, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. We know what we have in this team. We know what we have in this ball you know, this ball club. We know the staff that they've put together, which is even better than they were last year. And there was a great staff last year. Yeah. This team is absolutely built for a fucking run. But we have to get through the first round of the playoffs first. I think once you get over that that hump again, I think this team is just going to have the utmost confidence, and I think that's going to be the sealer. But mm -mm. there's going to be some good teams this year. Like I said, I think Houston, they're going to be a tough, tough team this year. Yeah, because they have Stroud now. He he's he is the guy, and I'm telling you what, it may not be this year. But by year three or four, CJ Stroud's gonna be a league MVP. Oh, thousand um, percent. And the only reason why I don't say this year is because there's there's probably gonna be some other guys that are gonna go off. And I'm not saying Watson's gonna have a MVP year, but he's gonna be back in the Pro Bowl. I think Watson's gonna have a Pro Bowl year. I think the addition of Ken Dorsey is bigger than anybody thinks. And I'm, um, dude, I'm so ready to see what this offense is going to look like. And again, I think as a Browns fan in general, I think we're all just really excited to once again prove to the media that they are fucking wrong mm -hmm. and that this team is built for greatness. So that's my final thoughts. I don't know what else you got to add, but <laughs> I, I'm, oh. I'm done worrying about what the media says. I, I know what we have here. Yeah, um, my final thoughts is, first off, I'm a thousand percent with you. I, I think what the media says is just complete bullshit. And they're obviously they're biased towards certain teams and whatnot. We all know this. We've been Browns fans our whole lives. We, we know the media hates the Cleveland Browns. We And we discussed this earlier and before the show and whatnot that it seems like every single year, year especially the last four years when the browns have actually been a good team yeah for some reason the media still thinks the browns are always finished last and are always going to be this mediocre ass team not just because of the players on the field and the coaching staff it's just because of the name of the team the cleveland browns the team of mediocrity and they're like well they're still the and it's the same thing that juju said before we beat his ass in pittsburgh you know the browns is the browns and i think the media is still taking that in now, don't get me wrong. There's still guys who are out there. I I can't remember the guy from NF or Good Morning Football, but he rides with us a thousand all percent time. Yep. Yep. all the time. Um, it's not Schrager; it's the other one. I can't think of the other guy's name. Yeah, but he rides with us, and I think he sees it. And there's one other guy. I can't remember his name either. But I don't know if you saw the podcast between them. It was an e I think it was an ESPN podcast or a Fox Sports podcast. And they had, like, their top, like, five teams or something. And the guy mentioned, like, no Browns. Like, the Browns yeah. have, like... Or, or they're talking about the fan bases of the NFL. And they didn't have the Browns. And the guy and the girl didn't have the Browns in there. And the guy's like, no Browns? Like, the Browns have been through hell and back for two decades after losing their team. And they showed up to every freaking game, full stadiums, no matter what. 
And he's like, even during the 0-16 season, they went full stadium, showing off of their team, even though they knew they were getting their asses kicked. Yeah. Like, that's dedication. That's loyalty. Like, and he's like, I don't think the Jets fans are super fucking loyal. No. Like, they could just go to the other New York team and be like, oh, I was a Giants fan this entire time. The Giants are so good and stuff. Yeah. Like, the Browns stick out with their team. So, there's a couple Browns defenders out there. But... For the rest of the media, there's always haters. They're always going to put the Browns dead last in the division, no matter how bad the Steelers could be, the Bengals could be, the Ravens could be. They always put the Browns last. Um, the Browns could have a the Browns could have the Kansas City Chiefs roster, and we still get put last in the division. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is for all Browns fans, don't don't listen to what the media has to say. Don't listen to what FanDuel's power rankings are. Don't listen to ESPN's power rankings. Those are all just for show and just for people to discuss shit. And, you know, Save we it. know that we, we yeah. yeah, those are receipts for the players yes. because the players are going to look at that. They're going to hang them up in the locker room and be like, listen, this is what the media thinks about us. Yeah. They think we're trash. We got Ken Dorsey. We had, we got Jim Schwartz last year. We got Mike Rabel we have the to best, chill with Jim Schwartz. The we have best defense in the entire league. And it's only going to be better. And everyone's predicting Miles Garrett back to back defensive player of the year. Like he's in he's literally in a tier of his own, was their yeah. quote. He's in yeah. a tier of his own. And they know that TJ Watt's a scum because <laughs> he oh well TJ Watt goes untouched against yeah. quarterbacks. I was like, yeah, because he's a linebacker who can just go untouched. Yeah. Like Miles Garrett's getting triple teamed and beating and beating those triple teams to get to the QB. That's more impressive than well. TJ Watt has four more sacks in him. Well, yeah, when you can go to the edge and go untouched, sure. Or you drop back in coverage, sure. But nobody's picking up on TJ Watt. And then he got killed by being a rookie last year on the Browns. So he got killed by Dewan Jones. So the, the thing I'm trying to say is the Browns have, like you said, the the be- one of the best coaching staffs, Kevin Stefanski, Ken Dorsey. Jim Schwartz, Mike Vrabel, um, the players on the roster look insane this year. We re-signed guys. We got guys in here, in the, especially in the linebacker position, that's going to bring some added leadership and whatnot. This team looks great on paper. This team's going to look fantastic. We've seen just videos of Deshaun working out on vacation and throwing balls, and the balls have looked good. They have zip on it. They're accurate passes. I, we think Deshaun's going to have a fantastic year. Let's just ride this thing out. Yeah. Ride it out. Keep your receipts. Yep. And as always, we stay the underdog, and that's exactly the way that I fucking like it. I love it. So uh, I'm. That's fine with me, dude. We it's we had we had the season that that we had, and now we got to prove that it wasn't a fluke. Yep. Uh, because you have a two-time coach of the year right now. You have my Mike Vrabel that was a coach of the year at one point. You have Jim Schwartz that was a coach of the year at one point. You have the tools. You have the mentorship. You have everything you need. And you have one of the best offensive coordinators in the league now, too, and Ken Dorsey. And guess what? We're going to have a better O-line this year because everybody's healthy again. Yep. So, and that that's what killed us against Houston in the playoffs. So... We'll do. We'll see you guys in January. We'll see you guys in December. We'll we'll, we'll see you guys when it fucking matters because this team is going to be a playoff team again. And, and Absolutely. That's, and that's my final thought. So, Andrew, it was good talking. We will see you guys next week with some more Gardos talk and uh, honestly, hopefully, some more basketball news because I miss basketball. So yeah, we'll see you guys next week.